So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Johnny Olkers. I am a uh, kind of a principal. I run this little online school that we have next door called Grizzly Mountain. And uh, before COVID, I was a high school science teacher. And I still teach science classes at Grizzly Mountain. And we have kids. We're like a hybrid school. So we have kids come in two days a week. And I still get to teach uh, middle school science. Um, and then I teach middle school in here, uh, usually on Sundays, and so I don't get to sit with the grown-ups. Um, and so that's why I was joking around about managing middle schoolers. Um, so we're going to be in Mark chapter 7 today, so you can open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. And uh, I'm going to pray before we get started here. God, as we open up your word today, I pray you'd speak to us, Lord, as we work through the text of scripture, Lord, I pray your spirit would be guiding us and leading us. God, I pray you'd illuminate the text for us and that you would speak to us, give us eyes to see and ears to hear today, God. Let the church hear what the spirit is saying to the church today. God, let us each one of us in this church um, just be, have a heart that is, is um, alive to you, God, that is fresh and moldable. Let us not be like Pharaoh who hardened his heart against you, God, but let us, let us be um, like you talk about in the Old Testament, people who have a, a heart of flesh, God, that is is um, able to be sensitive to you, God. Let us be like David, whose heart is after you, God. God, we want to be in touch with you. God, we want to stay in step with you today. So move by your spirit and let us walk and stay in step with you today, God. Speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach through uh, verse 23. So we're going to be in chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. I'm teaching through the book of Mark uh, with uh, middle school right now. And um, we went through this pretty recently. And, uh, you know, I just, after watching, uh, how many of you went to uh, the, G or how many of you have seen the Jesus Revolution movie? Yeah, that's awesome, right? You know, um, I want to say it was probably eight years ago, there was a movie that came out about the history of Calvary Chapel, and we're, you know, Calvary Chapel is not big on, like, we're not, like, a, I don't think we're technically a denomination. I think we're, like, a, a movement. I think that's how we classify ourselves. We're very, we're very, like, non-traditional. We're not, we don't want any sort of, like, religious... We just want to get away from the word religious as much as we can, you know. So no denomination, no thanks, you know. And but I think about eight years ago, there was a, a a documentary that came out about the history of Calvary Chapel that I watched, and it was right when we moved here. And I suggested to Rory like, "Hey, maybe we should like get the church together on a Wednesday night and like watch that, you know." And we never did. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, that sounds cool," you know. And it, it's like we've got some pretty cool roots, you know. And, uh, but we don't really talk about it around here very much, you know, Calvary Chapel. Where, where did that even come from, you know? And um, I think it's really cool they made an epic movie about Calvary Chapel's history, you know, that's way cooler than a documentary. Because I went back a couple of years ago and I rewatched that documentary. I was thinking about showing it to our youth group. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is super boring. Kids would never watch this, you know? But like this Jesus Revolution movie just came out and like, you know... Uh, what's the guy's name that played Frazier on TV? Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer is getting interviewed by, like, Jimmy Fallon. I don't know if he was on Jimmy Fallon, but he's getting interviewed by, like, you know, people in the media. It's like, yes, Calvary Chapel, man. People are hearing about it. It's, like, exciting, right? And, and you know, Rory did a great job if you came on the Wednesday night when the church rented the place out. Rory did a great job after the movie of getting us all there and just kind of being his, you know, really wimpy self and crying in front of us and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, but, it, you know, there's really something beautiful in that movie and, and taking a few minutes to reflect. And I've just been reflecting on that movie 
and thinking about it. So I, I read, I don't know, I was reading through this passage again, and, and I was just thinking, like, this is a good passage to go through to kind of reflect on that movie a little bit. And, uh, and so I got a couple questions of reflection here as we just also just read through the scripture. And so one of the nice things about, you know, Rory leaving the country, Rory and Chris leaving the country is like, hey, you got to go to the third string quarterback, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I get a chance to teach once in a while. And so I, I get to pick what I want to teach on. And because it's really hard. What Rory does is really hard when you just teach through the whole Bible, which is one of the cool things about Calvary Chapel, is we just go through the text, which is a really healthy practice. But when you're me and you're the third string quarterback, you get to just pick a random spot and go. And so um, that's what I'm doing. And I thought we could reflect on that movie a little more. So that's, where, that's how I landed on this text. Okay, so, um, so here we are, chapter 7, verse 1. And uh, we're going to see an interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. And uh, and so it says here in verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 7 of Mark, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. And I'm going to, I'm just going to stop on verse 1 there. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to rant again for a second here. Now, how many of you... Stop talking about things going on in our culture. How many of you have watched The Chosen? Let me see the hands on that. Yeah. Okay, about the same, right? Like, if you're watching Jesus Revolution, you're probably watching The Chosen. Now, I recently heard um, a Christian who I love, Christian woman who goes to our church, who I love, kind of just, I think I saw a Facebook post, and it was just kind of this rant about how The Chosen is so unbiblical. And I remember thinking huh, that's an interesting perspective, you know? And, uh, and it, it isn't the Bible. The TV show The Chosen isn't the Bible. That's true. But what I, I actually have a t- totally different perspective on the show. I think it's a great thing. I think the TV show The Chosen is a great thing. But it is important to recognize that it's not the Bible, right? It's got all kinds of stuff in it that's not the Bible, like the, the fact that Matthew is, uh, you know, he's got Asperger's, right? Like that's totally not in the Bible, okay? Thomas is, I mean, spoiler alert, how many of you have seen season three already? Okay, I'm halfway through season three. So like Thomas is going to plug your ears if you're not watching season three. I, looks like, I haven't seen it happen yet, I'm only on episode four, but it looks like Thomas is probably going to get engaged, okay? Totally not in the Bible, all right, there's probably a hundred other little details in this show that are just artistic license, right? But what's cool about The Chosen is it gets you to really think about what is in the Bible and what isn't, right? It gets you to go back and read the Bible and be like, oh, wh- why did they put that in there? Is there some evidence in the text that made them think that way? Is, that, is there a clue there that led them to that? Is that in there? And it makes you go back and read it again and again and, and kind of form opinions about the text of Scripture and, and test the Scriptures like the Bereans. And, uh, and it, it just sort of brings it alive, you know? Like some people are like really nerdy and they love reading. I'm not one of those people. I think most of us probably aren't like that. A lot of us, you know, my age and younger and maybe older, uh, we grew up not reading but watching TV all the time. You know, I hate to say it. And, uh, and so for me, like, watching things is a great way to learn. And so watching The Chosen helps bring the scripture to life for me, and I go back and I read it and I, I chew on it more. And so um, another thing that's happened to me recently is I got to go on that trip to Israel that we did in November. And so when we were in Israel, they would pass around this map they had the 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 first day we were there our our guide his name was a meat and he had rory we went into like this gas station i don't know if it was a gas station it was like a little mini mart and had this three-dimensional map of the of the country of israel and you could like feel the mountains and had all the cities on it and then every time we went somewhere they'd pass this thing around the bus and they'd be like look at where we are and so you started looking at this map of where we were and where we were going and um I wish I could show you a map right now. Galilee 
is like the Prineville or the central Oregon of Israel, okay? Galilee is like, it's, it's, but it's north. It's not, you know, central. It's north of uh, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem's like the Portland of the state, okay? Israel's probably, I don't know, it's maybe about the size of Oregon. But so the big place is Jer- Jerusalem. And then there's, there's the Sea of Galilee, which is kind of a region, but it's not like the big deal place, right? So Jesus does most of his ministry in this place that's not the big deal of the state, you know, except it's a country. And so these guys show up. So anyway, like there's a couple reasons that, that I can read this text and I can appreciate what's going on here besides the fact that I've just studied the Bible. I've watched The Chosen. If you watch The Chosen, you get the sense like, oh, Nicodemus, he's from, he's from uh, Jerusalem, and he comes, right? And you get, this, you get this kind of sense of how things worked from watching The Chosen. You Also, if you go to Israel, you get the sense of like, oh, Galilee's kind of outside of the big place, right? So here we are in the text. Anyway, I would suggest to you, watch The Chosen. It starts to make the Bible come a little more alive for you, okay? So here we are in verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem, okay? So these guys come from Jerusalem. They're coming from the place of power, the, pr- the place of prestige, the place of we're the most important of society, right? The way that Portland thinks of themselves in Oregon, like the way that Portland would think of themselves compared to central Oregon or especially uh, compared to Prineville, right? Like, oh, can anything good come out of Prineville, you know, right? Like we're Portland. We've got it all figured out, right? So these guys show up and, and they think they've got it all together. They're the big wigs, right? And they're coming to see Jesus because they've heard about this weirdo out in, you know, out in Galilee. And now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. And so when I first read this, I thought, oh, the disciples aren't following some of the law, some of the Torah, some of the written rules, right? But then you read in verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. So it doesn't say here, holding the law of Moses. It says, holding the tradition of the elders. Okay? Uh, And then we read again in verse 4, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper vessels, and couches. I wonder what it would be like to wash a whole couch. I'm not sure I understand that word there in the text, but it seems like they had a whole way to wash their entire couch. I wonder what their couches were made of back then. Okay? Okay. And so uh, we see a little more of this in verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And so if you're reading this text for the first time, if you've started to understand how it works, like if you've read, you know, we're in chapter 7 here, there are rules in the Old Testament that Jesus was on board with, right? Like Jesus didn't go around eating pork, right? And Jesus didn't go around working on the Sabbath. So, like, Jesus was a Jew, and Jesus followed the Old Testament law. Like, Jesus had respect for the law of Moses. And so I I asked myself a question in my notes here. Do the Pharisees have the right system? So Jesus followed the rules normally. Were Were his disciples making mistakes here? And it's important to notice um, that they did not have the right system, Okay. So there's a difference between the law of Moses that Jesus followed. You know, he said he came to fulfill the law. He did not come to break the law. These guys are not asking Jesus about the law of Moses. They're asking Jesus about holding the tradition of the elders, um, about things that they ha- they, which they have received from elders and hold, and He's, they're complaining that they don't walk according to the tradition of the elders. So we're, we're not talking about scripture. We're talking about tradition. Okay? And so this isn't about, do, they're not doing the law of Moses. This is about they're not doing the traditions of the elders. 
okay? There's a clear distinction here. So let's see how Jesus responds to this question about traditions that are above and beyond the scripture. How do you think it's going to go? Okay, in verse 6, he answers, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written. Oh, oh, that's not how you make friends, Jesus. You notice, like, one thing I love about Jesus, this is, I mean, this is what, this is what is so compelling about Jesus, to even, like, especially in the world we live in right now, with, like, the, the woke, you know, the speak truth to power, you know, liberals, is they like the idea of not, they like the idea of lifting up the oppressed, right? Well, guess where that idea came from? That idea came from Jesus, right? Here are the people in power coming to the nobodies of society in Galilee, and they're trying to oppress them. And here's Jesus speaking for the oppressed right here. He's speaking to the people in power, and he's being hard on them. And he's sticking up for those who are oppressed, right? It's just that we don't throw away all rationality in, in speaking up for the oppressed. And so here's Jesus. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? And then when I was studying for this, an interesting thing someone pointed out is this wasn't a prophecy that Jesus quotes. So Jesus quotes this, this text from Isaiah. It's not a prophecy. It's just, it's just Isaiah telling the people of the time, you know, whenever Isaiah was written 500, 1,000 years before, he was telling the people of that time, hey, you guys are hypocrites. You know, you do this. And Jesus takes it and he says, hey, this thing that Isaiah said to these people 1,000 years ago, it's a prophecy about you as well. And so Jesus is saying, hey, the, the Bible that's about them, it's also about you. You know, and that's kind of how the Bible is. You know, the Bible isn't written to us, but we can see ourselves in it as well, right? And so, like, what we're going to do is we're going to take this text today. This isn't written to us, but it's also about us, you know? And Jesus, there's a, there's a way that the, the scriptures are sort of um, useful in the moment, but also useful in general, right? And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's, he's taking the scripture and he's saying, hey, this thing that was true over there, it's also true of you guys. And he says, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's saying, hey, you really important religious people from Portland, you know, you guys care so much about what things look like on the outside, but your hearts are dead to God and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines. Doctrine is a fancy word for, you know, ideas about God. Teaching as important ideas about God, the commandments of men. So they had taken traditions and they had made them as important or more important than the real teachings about God that were written down as the Bible. And he keeps going. For they lay aside the commandments of God. They lay aside the law, the book of Moses, the books of Moses. They lay aside God's word. And you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said, all too well you reject or, or another translation of that word right there is you neglect. I don't think they knowingly rejected. They didn't intentionally reject the scriptures. What happened is they neglected. They, they got so obsessed with their dumb rules about how they washed their hands that they forgot about the actual important rules that were written in the Bible. And, it, and I, I, I studied a lot about this. It, it was like they had to wash their hands by, can't do this with the microphone. Uh, here we go. Ready? Shout at the microphone. They would wash their hands by pouring the water this way, and then they'd flip it over, and then they'd pour the water this way. This wasn't about, like, is it a good idea to wash your hands? This was about, like, we have a very 
spiritual way of washing our hands. And we do it whenever we go to the marketplace. And it was on top of the rules that God had given the Israelites about washing their hands. So it's like, oh, God said to wash your hands like this and at this time. Well, we wash our hands 17 other times a day as well because we're so spiritual, right? So they were, they were becoming like ultra um, clean because, oh, God already has rules about how to be clean. Well, we're going to be clean on top of clean, you know, and they were becoming ultra religious. Jesus, I, there's some good, great passages. I didn't bring them up, but there's some great passages where Jesus talks about how they lay extra rules on top of people. And it's like these, these giant yokes on top of people. A yoke is like this thing that the, they put on an animal before it would plow, you know, it's, and, and so Jesus said, you, you lay all this extra weight on people, and it's a yoke they can't bear that you yourselves can't even bear. And then later on, Jesus would say, but my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? And um, let's see, where did I want to? Okay, so I'm going to, I want to talk about this for a second. So Jesus, Jesus clearly rejects this idea right? Jesus clearly rejects this idea of adding traditions on top of a religious, the, on top of the scripture, okay? So what I want to talk about today, and I still have, you know, we're going to get through the text some more, but what I want to talk about today is this movie, Jesus Revolution. There are just a couple moments in that movie that I want to talk about, okay? So the first question I want to ask is, you know, this really happened, this, this movie, uh, this, this stuff really happened, right? So Chuck Smith was really a guy in Costa Mesa, California, who let the hippies into his church, right? And I don't know, I'm not an expert on, on exactly what went down because I'm just a baby, okay? I was born in 1984, way younger than all you old timers, okay? Perry, I'm sure you were around back then. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, but I, so I'm just going to go off a few things in the movie that may or may not have really been, been part of it. But, um, but I think the principles that we see in that movie are, are about right. Okay? So, so why was Chuck Smith the man God used to reach the hippies? And I'm sure he's not the only one. But what the amazing thing about Chuck Smith's story is, and I've watched some documentaries about it too, is he was, he was a guy with a tiny little church in Costa Mesa, California, right? And, um, he, and he was like 40 years old, okay? He wasn't like a 23-year-old hippie himself, right? And, and he had like a, just a fledgling little church, right? And, uh, and now there's over 1,000 Calvary chapels. There are Calvary chapels in like, like there's a Calvary chapel right now where our friends are in Kathmandu, I mean, that's where they started. And I guess in this little town of uh, Dumre, you know, like, I, it's amazing. You get on Facebook, and what they're doing is somehow on the Internet, like in the Himalayas, you know. Like, I, I got on last night, I think, and I think it was Russell was, was preaching to some kids, you know. It's like, man, that's awesome, you know. The Internet is amazing, isn't it? Um. And that's probably, I don't know if that thing's a Calvary Chapel, but there's a little church up there, you know? And, uh, and so it's just exploded, right? And, uh, and so how did that happen, you know? Um, and, and so here's what I wrote down. Why was Chuck Smith the man God used to reach the hippies? You look at the guy, he's, he's bald, he's middle-aged. In the movie, he's wearing, a, I think somebody told me he wears, wears a suit and tie his whole, whole career, um, I used to listen to him on the radio when I was in college. He sounded so boring, you know, like, and, and, uh, and he would, and he, I think he used the King James version of the Bible the whole time. You know, we, we use the new King James here, which is still kind of like, you know, religious and stuffy, which I love because it's like pretty literal translation. It's very academic, you know, and, um, and so, in some ways, I think you could, the only thing you can say is, like, it was a, an amazing work of the Holy Spirit. But, um, but here's what I wrote down. One time I was listening to the radio, 
This, I, I wish I could find this. I was listening to the radio in college, and like he had a, it's like they accidentally left the mic on during the end of worship, uh, or the, after the church service. You know, he's preaching, and then they accidentally left Chuck Smith's mic on, and he's singing, and it's like, Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. And had his old man, Chuck Smith, voice singing a song. It was amazing. Okay, so, uh, so here's what I, I said. That, so there's this moment in the movie where these, these elders are coming into Chuck Smith's office, right? And they're like, they're like threatening him. Like, you're, this church is going to crash if you let these hippies in, because all the religious folks are going to leave the church, and they're the ones who give money. I mean, that's kind of the impression, right? You know, and uh, and so he's got this pressure from these religious people with their fancy religious clothes, saying, "Hey, we're the ones who pay the tithe around here. You, we can't have hippies in here, right?" And then and then there's that moment in the movie where they're like, "The hippies' feet are dirty. They're they're ruining the new carpet, right?" And, um, and so he's got the kind of this religious pressure on him. Not that, I'm guessing Calvary Chapel back then was probably not a very religious church to begin with, you know, because it was like a four-square church. But, um, so he's got all that pressure on him to like, hey, the way we do things around here, the hippies don't fit in, you know. They, they wear weird clothes, they smell bad, they don't wear shoes, Right. And what I love, and this is what I wrote down, Chuck Smith was able to let go of his traditions, but hold on to the word of God and the heart of God. And when you read this text, those are the things that Jesus won't let go of. Jesus is like, I don't care about your traditions, Pharisees. I don't care about your hand-washing system. But I do care about the word of God, and I do care about the heart of God. And I think, I think what, the, what the progressive Christians, you know, where they're at is they want to pretend like, yeah, I'm with Jesus, but they're ready to let go of everything, right? Like they're ready to, any, I will let go of anything to accept people, right? I will let, and it's not even, it's not even uh, loving people. The, there are, there's a certain brand of progressive Christianity. About 20 years ago, it was called the Emergent Church. And they are ready to let go of basically any Christian teaching as long as they can accept people. It's just wacky. I mean, it's just insane. Like, there is no teaching of the Bible whatsoever. They will not forsake if it means they can accept people. And Jesus isn't doing that here. Okay? Jesus isn't saying, hey, Pharisees, I'm letting go of the law of Moses. I'm letting go of your traditions. I'm letting go of all moral teachings just so I can accept people. Jesus isn't doing that, right? He's saying, I'm letting go of your traditions, and I'm holding on to the authority of Scripture. And as we get further into this passage, I'm holding on to moral, you know, um, obje objective moral truth. But I am letting go of traditions. And so things could have gone really sideways for Chuck Smith if he had said, I'm letting go of all truth so that I can love hippies. But he, he didn't do that, right? He held on to uh, the word of God and the heart of God, but he did let go of tradition. Okay, so Calvary Chapel didn't become some heretic church that accepts all kinds of weird behaviors, but it became a church where there are hippies, but the, the, the teaching of the word of God is like a central part of Calvary Chapel, and that's, that's why it's a successful church, right? Okay, um, and then I want to reflect on that a little further and say, and we're going to get further into the text here in a second, but I want to say, how does that apply to us today? Calvary Chapel's been around since the 70s. Like, we're like 53 years past 1970, guys. How old does that make you feel? Okay. Um, I think I heard something recently, like 1970. Let's do the math here. 1977 is a far, as far away from the year 2000 as 19 or 2023. 
We're getting old, guys. We're getting real old. <laughs> it's okay, though. It's okay. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth. We're going to live forever, okay? So here's, here's my thought. Calvary Chapel is not a new thing anymore. Um, what are the traditions? Like, you look at, you look at, like, the Methodist church, right? The Methodist church was once, like, the young, fresh move of the Holy Spirit. I had this, this is, this is just maybe total heresy, but I had this dream once. I was on a mission trip in Portland when I was in college. I had this dream that there were all these churches in the darkness, and this, this light was coming in, and it was filling one church at a time, and then it was leaving, and it was going, and it was filling the next church, and it was filling the next church. And I woke up, and it was like a nightmare, and it was terrifying. And maybe I was just had some bad spaghetti, okay? But, like, I woke up, and it was like the Holy Spirit fills a church for a while, and then he moves on to the next one. And I, I'm not sure that's a biblical idea, but it's kind of what you see in church history, you know? The Methodist church, I think it was Jonathan Wesley. Am I, am I right? Yeah? Okay, Jonathan Wesley was amazing. And you look at the Methodist church today, and I'm not an expert on church history, but there's some wacky stuff going on in a lot of the Methodist churches today, you know? And it's like, it's like human nature to like have God by the Holy Spirit do some amazing things through, through people, and churches are planted and started and movements happen, and then those people die and their children die, and pretty soon it turns into just madness, you know? And it's like there's no reason Calvary chapels aren't going to go just as sideways, probably faster because we have even less structure built in, you know? And like, so I wrote down, what are the traditions that are starting to keep us from reaching the people around us? Okay? Like, when I was in college, like, before, I just got saved, and it was like, I thought there were some things we were doing that was like, these are the, these are the techniques that save people, okay? Number one, you can't wear fancy clothes, okay? Number two, you can't have church in a church-looking building, Okay, people will not get saved if you have church in a church looking building like having church here. I don't know if anyone can get saved here, guys. Okay, if you wear, if you tuck in your shirt, I don't know if anyone can get saved. Okay, I'm dead serious, guys. This is what I learned in college. Okay, number three, you have to turn out the lights during worship. Okay, that's a Calvary Chapel distinctive that I learned in college. Number four, there has to be bass and drums, okay? Number five, people have to raise their hands and worship. Number six, I don't know. These were the things that I thought made the Holy Spirit show up, right? Turns out, you read the New Testament, none of those things are in there. It's been a while. I've had to study closely to figure out what really happens to make the Holy Spirit show up, okay? So, I'm making jokes, right? But um, what are the things that we, as Christians, think are essential that are not essential, right? What are the traditions? We all have them. What are the things that we think, this is, this is what we have to do to do church right, or this is what we have to do to be Christians right, that are, they're not, they're not in the Bible, but we're doing them. And they might actually, maybe right now they're fine, they're socially relevant, they work. But at some point, or maybe already, they're actually going to start getting in the way of us being able to reach people with the gospel. Okay? For Chuck Smith, it, maybe it wasn't the clothes he wore. Because it worked, because he, he was willing to take in people who didn't wear the clothes he wore. Right? But some of the people in his church, they walked out of the building. Right? My, my favorite part in that whole movie is that moment when the guy walks out and then the next guy stands up and then he goes and he sits down with the hippies. That's the best part of the whole movie right there. I love that moment. I want to be that guy, right? So I wrote down four things. These are just random things in my head. What are the traditions that are keeping us from reaching the people around us? Is it related to the people we invite into our homes? 
okay? I, I listened to this girl uh, on a blog or on a podcast um, this week. Her name's Rosaria Butterfield. Used to be a lesbian. And uh, she's married to a pastor now. She's an author. She was a liberal gender studies professor uh, who was a lesbian who became a Christian and now a pastor's wife and a Christian author. Her name's Rosaria Butterfield. She's written a number of books. One of the books she's written is called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And she got saved because a pastor just became her friend and started talking to her about Jesus when she was doing a book about Christianity and why she was trying to investigate why do Christians hate gay people. Turns out Christians don't hate gay people. But um, she got to know a real Christian who was really smart and started to really become open to the idea of Jesus because they would hang out in his house with his wife, and, and she was just getting to know real Christianity. And, uh, and so that's a, I, I've never actually read that book. I know Rory has, um, but I've listened to her on a lot of podcasts, and it's super fascinating, you know, but maybe we, maybe we have this idea that we don't associate too closely. Like, we might talk to somebody at work, but we don't have a meal, with somebody, who, you know, we don't, Jesus can eat with sinners and be accused of eating with sinners, but we don't do that, right? Okay. Uh, another thing I wrote down, do we as Christians have certain boundaries that we've set related to financial risks that we aren't willing to take related to the gospel or related to preventing ourselves from being able to do things uh, you know, I think of, of like life insurance or retirement, you know, or we got to have the mortgage or, you know, I, I think, I think probably these are probably deeper things, but American traditions of like, well, this is how you live your life. And I wonder how many of those kind of things are preventing us from living in a way that we could further the gospel. Um. Are there traditions related to the way things were done in the past when we became believers? I kind of spoke to some of those silly things that I believed early on that I thought were essential. Um, you know, the, I, I'm speaking more to us in our personal lives, but I, I also wonder as our church and the way our church functions, um, is it related to assumptions we've made about how we're going to raise our kids? Well, you have to homeschool. Well, you can't homeschool. That's not feasible. You know, like... I think we all have um, just a lot of traditions and assumptions that we make that if we bring them before God, we may find that God pushes us in a different direction. All right. Now, we got to keep moving because I've got about negative five minutes left. Um, so verses 6 through 16, let's keep reading here. My, I got two more questions to get through. What are the specific things Jesus takes issue with regarding the Pharisees' tradition? Uh, I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to start in verse 10. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who cur uh, curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. So, so there was this weird thing they had worked out where, oh, I can't, I can't take care of you, mom and dad, because... You know, I, I can't, mom and dad call, I mean, I've heard this described a couple different ways in things I read this week, but basically, like, mom and dad are like, hey, can I come over for the weekend? And you're like, oh, sorry, mom and dad, um, my house, I've uh, consecrated it to God, so you're going to have to stay in a hotel, you know? And it's like, but you're supposed to honor your mom and dad, but my house is consecrated to God, so I can't, you know, it's just sort of like, what, you know? And And there's some historical context, you can read on that if you're really interested, but it was just some really strange tradition that trumped scripture that they used to get around things. And so Jesus is calling him out on this kind of nonsense. And then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man. Now, this is, this is really interesting. So Jesus takes issue with the Pharisees having a tradition that is above the Scripture. The Scripture is key. 
We have a, we have a tradition. Uh-oh. We have a presupposition as Protestants called sola scripture. And this is really where we derive it from. We don't value tradition as, as Protestants, as people who are not Catholics, as people who are only Bible people. This is where we get this idea. You don't go off of traditions from past um, religious teachers, okay? That's what these Jews were doing. These Jews, this is actually a lot like Catholics. These Jews, there's a lot of parallels. These Jews ultimately trace this idea back to Moses. They say, oh, these traditions come all the way from Moses. Oh, and, and this is all from Jerusalem, you know? And the Roman Catholics today, their traditions, they call it the magisterium. Oh, the magisterium comes all the way back from Peter. Oh, and it goes all the way back to Rome, you know? And it's like every religious system seems to seems to do this, you know? Oh, and this is why we wear all these funny clothes, you know? And it's like, humans have a, do a great job of making up weird religions where you wear funny clothes and there's a big, long tradition back to some important city, you know? And as, as, as Protestants, we're kind of like, you know what? We're just going to go off the Bible and have a direct relationship with God. And we have this do- doctrine called sola scripture that the Bible alone dictates what we believe about God. Okay, and then, so Jesus took uh, a serious issue with this idea that tradition plus scripture is how you know God. Okay, and so as, as Protestants, we don't believe that. And then... The other thing is, is Jesus took issue with the idea that all this external stuff somehow makes you holy. And here he goes on verse 15. He says, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. If you don't wash your hands the right way, it's not going to make you ceremonially uh, unrighteous. Okay. But the things from that come from out of you, those are the things that defile you. Jesus, and this is amazing, Jesus is changing the rules, you know, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that it's no longer about, um, you know, not eating pork and washing your hands the right way and, you know, all these Old Testament rules anymore. It's about your heart before God and, and having a heart that's right before God. And so, um, he says it's, it's, it's about what's inside of you. It's not about what you do. It's, it's about what's inside of you. It's not what happens on the outside of you. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then his disciples are perplexed by this. And so when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning this parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? It must have been, it must have been kind of hard to get rebuked by Jesus like that all the time. I'm going to think, I'm going to say like Jesus is probably nice about it. He's like, guys, you still don't get it. It's okay. I love you. Okay. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart? So your heart here is like your soul, right? But it's his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Okay, and he said, what comes out of a man defiles him. This is really deep philosophy from Jesus. And, and I wrote, my last question is, what is the goal, really, right? With these hippies that came into the church, with the people in Prineville who we want to reach, what is the real goal? Is it to produce people who wash their hands the right way? No, this is the goal. For what from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, fornication is a fancy word for sex outside of marriage, murder. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. Thefts, covetousness, just just coveting things. I think this is one of those things in America that we just don't even get it. Like, you know how you constantly like desire more stuff all the time and look at things? I'm just window shopping. I'm just clicking on things on Amazon on Black Friday or is that what they call it now? No, it's uh, Cyber Monday, you know? I'm just seeing what the deals are. I just need more, you know? Wickedness. That seems pretty broad. Deceit, lewdness, an evil eye. You ever have somebody just look at you like this? You know? Blasphemy, pride, foolishness. I think foolishness is like what the world is currently encouraging um, teenagers to do and live into the, until like age 35, you know, like just go out and get super drunk and just be sexually promiscuous till you're like 27 at the youngest, you know, like, 
It used to be like foolishness was like, oh yeah, just grow up as fast as possible and become a responsible young adult. Now it's like, oh, you're young. Just go out and live for the world for 20 years at least and then settle down, have a child at age 42. You know, like it's just so stupid. Okay, all these evil things come from within. I love it when the Bible gives us a list of what not to be. And then usually the Bible also gives us a list of what to be right? Right next to it. It doesn't do that here, but like in Galatians chapter 5, I think. Um, Jacob, can you bring up Galatians 5, 16? So like the goal of following Jesus is to not be this way, but to be the other way, right? And if you, uh, if you look at the lists in Ephesians or Galatians, Galatians 5, 16 says, something to the effect of walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So instead of, instead of doing all these dark, evil things that Jesus, this is Jesus right here. Okay. This is the same Jesus. The world likes to say, Oh, Jesus said, don't judge. Right. Oh, Jesus just told you all those wicked things come out of your heart. Okay. He just judged you pretty hard. Okay. But Jesus also, his disciples his apostles would give you this list of all these dark things that come out of your heart, but then he would say, oh, but let the Holy Spirit rule in your hearts instead, and, and out of your heart will come love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self, uh, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, right? And then he'll say, and walk in the Spirit, and you will not... Um, I just lost it. I just, it was right there. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. The, the darkness that's possible in you doesn't have to come out of you if the Holy Spirit is, is filling you, right? And so the goal of Christianity is not to produce people who follow all these religious traditions that we have of, you know, the goal is not to produce people who wear a suit and tie in church, right? The goal is not to produce, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a heretic. I like to wear a hat in church. Guys, do you want to know why Calvary Chapel, everybody wears hats here? It's me. I started it. I did, okay? Started wearing a hat for worship like seven years ago. Look how it spread. I take full credit, okay? The goal of church is not to produce religious looking people who wear fancy clothes and don't fit in in society outwardly, right? I think, I think if we look on the outside, just like everybody else, that's actually a good thing. Okay. But on the inside and in the behavior, in the speech, in the way we treat people, we're different. Now there's success, right? So Jesus is not looking to produce Pharisees on the outside. He doesn't want to make us different on the outside in the outward appearance. He wants to make us different in our behavior, in the way we talk to people, in the way we love people, in the way that we don't covet. We, we're not wicked. We're not liars. We don't blaspheme. We don't have pride. We don't act in foolish ways. We don't have all these evil thoughts. We don't murder. We don't commit adultery. Those are the things that Jesus wants, that the, that the darkness doesn't come out of our hearts and doesn't change our behavior in those ways. But I think he wants us to look like ordinary people walking around. That's what I think. Okay. So closing it up, what's the goal? Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I, what I want you guys to, to get from today is I want you to go away from today asking yourself the question, what are the traditions, and, and Clay, you can come back up. I sure hope Clay's in here. There he is. Uh, what I want you to walk away today with is what are the traditions that you have that are keeping you from keep reaching the people around you, okay? I want you to think about Chuck Smith and the way he was willing to give up some of the things that he thought were normal. You know, at the beginning of that movie, he, I think what he said about the hippies when he saw them on TV was he said something like, I think they need a bath, right? I think that was what he said when he saw the hippies on TV, right? But then he was, and he didn't just, you know, it didn't start with the hippies in his church. It started with the hippies in his house, right? And so I want you to ask yourself, what are the traditions that you have 
maybe in your house, okay? Maybe in your personal life. What are the traditions that you have that are keeping you from reaching the people around you? Christianity is not just what we do on church, in church on Sunday. Christianity is what we do in our life every day, right? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for these wonderful people willing to sit here and listen to me ramble and hopefully open the scriptures. I pray that you would speak to them through Mark chapter 7 today, and uh, I pray you'd move in their lives. God, help them to find uh, things in their lives that need adjustment, that they could be more effective in following you and reaching the world around them. Glorify yourself today, Lord, through their lives and this week. In Jesus' name, amen.